Thank you all for standing by and welcome to our webinar entitled Why Environmentally Conscious Shoppers Don't Bring Reusable Bags. This is a brand new webinar series called Freshwater Science that will highlight Ohio Sea Grant and partnering scientists every month. Every quarter is a different focus from human health and fish farming to harmful algal blooms and human decision making, bringing applied research to the public on issues that affect our Lake Erie communities. I am Jill Gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant Stone Laboratory, and joining me today are Jill Bartolotta and Dr. Scott Hardy from Ohio Sea Grant. Jill Bartolotta is an extension educator at Ohio Sea Grant for the Lake and Ashtabula counties. She works with communities to conduct outreach and education about Lake Erie, develop partnerships to foster a collaborative approach to management of natural resources issues, and bring science into decision-making processes. Her areas of focus include environmental education, marine debris, wildlife ecology, and climate change impacts, among others. Dr. Scott Hardy is an educator, extension educator with Ohio Sea Grant based in Cleveland. He conducts applied research and develops education outreach programs on collaborative watershed management, coastal storm resiliency, community-based response to ecological change and other issues facing Lake Erie and, great, and the Great Lakes. The results of his work help to inform decision-making among practitioners and policymakers, as well as educate local and regional stakeholders about issues impacting the Lake Erie watershed. We're delighted to have both Jill and Scott here today to discuss their research. But before we do a few things about the logistics of the webinar, during our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, around 1220, I'll conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to pull up the chat feature anytime during their talk, and I will collect and pose your questions out to Jill and Scott at the end of their presentation. As a reminder, this webinar has auto-captioning and is being recorded to be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the half an hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Jill Bartolotta and Dr. Scott Hardy presenting why environmentally conscious shoppers don't bring reusable bags. Scott and Jill. Thanks, Jill, and hi, everyone. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen with the presentation and we'll get started. All right. Can you see that okay? Looks great. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. We are going to be talking about bag, um, the issues of plastic bags here in Ohio, and then looking at support for bag reduction strategies. So really quickly, I just want to introduce everyone to the issue of plastics in water. 22 million pounds of plastics enter the Great Lakes each year. 96% of these plastics are going to be single-use plastics. So these are going to be things like plastic bags, bottle caps, straws, cigarettes, food wrappers. These are primarily coming off the landscape through our everyday activities, and then they get into the water through intentional or accidental littering. They get um, in the storm drains when we have large rain events that takes everything from the road, puts it in a storm drain and that goes directly into the water. And plastic in the water is not a good thing. It's not supposed to be there and it causes a lot of issues. Some of the issues it causes affect our wildlife. We commonly see animals entangled in items like masks, plastic mesh, bags, fishing line, and then also animals are starting to ingest these plastics. So the smaller the plastic, we call those microplastics, those are able to be eaten by the tiniest animals on earth, which are zooplankton. Also, there's several human health impacts that we're being made more and more aware of each day. Plastic is found in everything that we are eating and drinking. It is found in your tap water. Bottled water has two times more plastic in it, and that's because when they put the cap on the bottle, some of those plastic fragments will get into the water that you're about to drink. It's in the food you're eating, and it's also in the air that we're breathing. So we're exposed to the chemicals that are with plastic every day. There's lots of studies being done right now on the effects of plastic in humans. 
Um, we know that the chemicals that make plastic, we know them to be cancer causing. We also know that they disrupt the endocrine system, which controls our hormones, which controls every aspect in a living organism. Um, so we are seeing an increase in endocrine diseases, um, as well as diseases that affect our gut, the way we reproduce, the way we behave. And we're seeing this in other animals too. It's not just humans. So if you're interested in learning more about how chemicals can affect humans, this is a book I recommend. It's written by a medical doctor and it talks about how chemicals are affecting humans and our ability to continue to flourish as a society. It's also incredibly expensive when it gets in the natural environment. It's much easier to keep plastic and trash out of the environment than it is to clean it up. So this was a study that was conducted by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration several years ago. Ohio was one of their locations they chose for this environmental economic study. And they found that beaches, or water areas that are covered in trash, they will see less tourism. Well, if you have less tourism in an area, you're going to have less people visiting, that's less dollars in the economy. Coastal Ohio has a huge tourism impact for our area, so it's really important we keep our beaches clean so that we continue to have these tourism dollars coming into the economy. Also locally, this is a quick little study I did with some beach managers around the area to ask how much they spend per season picking trash up off of their beaches. And as you can see, it's tens of thousands of dollars per about a three to five month season. So that's a lot of money that our parks are paying to pick trash up off the beaches. So one of the items we've decided to focus on is plastic bags. The reason we focus on plastic bags is we don't find them a lot on beach cleanups, but they are found a lot on river or road cleanups because they often get tangled in brush before they ever make it to the beach. Also, bags are notorious for clogging storm drains. This can cause flooding in your home or flooding on your streets. And then also because Cuyahoga County was looking at a bag ban several years ago. So we wanted to get some information on bag use, on consumer support for bag reduction strategies. And so that's why we started this research. The bag ban, um, it is in effect. It cannot be enforced. There's a lot of logistical issues happening right now with the bag ban, but if you live in Cuyahoga County, you do have a bag ban. If you'd like more information about it, the county has a lot of great resources available to you, available to local um, retailers. So I encourage you to scan this QR code or visit this website if you want more information about the bag ban. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Scott now and he's gonna talk about the research that we've done. Hello, everybody, and uh, thanks, Jill. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about some of our work. Um, way back about uh, 2017, uh, Jill and I were contacted by the city of Cleveland, and we were uh, offered funding to conduct a research project on ways that the city could help reduce plastic marine debris, um, notably plastic uh, water bottles, drinking water bottles, plastic cigar tips, and plastic shopping bags. Um, we first approached the issue by uh, sending out a survey. We had almost 1,500 responses in total, so pretty pretty good amount of folks. Um, and one of the, the first questions we asked was, you know, just really simply, why don't you use recycle or reusable bags? You know, why are people still using plastics? And the number one response by far was that folks forget to bring them, that people have plenty of reusable bags, either at home or in their car, and they simply forget to use them. Um, Joe, can you move to the next slide? And not only do people have uh, plenty of plastic bags available to them, um, people actually have uh, more than enough plastic bags. In fact, we found that the vast majority of individuals who took our survey have a, a minimum of six and, and many actually over 20. Now, this was really important information um, for a couple of reasons, mainly because there's simply limited resources available for uh, communities, municipalities to address issues with plastic pollution. Uh, as Jill mentioned earlier, it could be really expensive. Um, and spending money to uh, pass out free reusable bags, basically we found that this is unnecessary, that folks have the bags. So it made us think of different strategies. Next slide, please. Um, 
In order to try to investigate strategies other than simply handing out reusable bags, uh, we received a grant from the NOAA Marine Debris Program, and we partnered with various stores in Cuyahoga County, both grocery stores and clothing stores, to uh, do a few things. First of all, to see how outreach and education would work. So you can see a picture of a couple of uh, my students there. Um, we, along with Jill and the students, we would park ourselves outside of uh, stores and talk to as many consumers as we could about the perils of plastic and importance of bringing your own reusable bags. Um, we also had several reminder strategies created. And if you look on the table there real close, you can see there's uh, various items, wooden keychains that say, don't forget your bags, little window decals to put on the side of your window in your car as you're getting out of your car, because a lot of people on that first survey said they leave them in their car, uh, and even some magnets for at home on your fridge who remember to bring them. Um, we also have a sign-up sheet there that we encourage anybody who is interested in and engaging in this project to give us their email so we can conduct a follow-up survey uh, asking more questions about uh, bag use. And so the way this project worked is we took about a month and we uh, basically sat outside these various stores and cataloged uh, a random sample of people leaving the stores and what they use to carry their goods. A plastic bag, paper bag, box, no bag, et cetera. Um, we then conducted about a month of this outreach program. Um, and in addition to all the reminder strategies you see on the table, we also had these really cool signs made, remember your reusable bags. Um, and, and each of the stores that we worked with was great about putting them up in their windows. So we had you know, these various sort of reminder strategies. And, and after a month of that, uh, we you know, took data again on uh, what people were using to carry their goods. And we were really excited because we thought, wow, these are you know, great reminder strategies. We did all this outreach and education. What are the results? Next slide. And what we found out is it didn't do a whole lot of anything. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the difference was, was really sort of, um, oh gosh, it was uh, unwelcome, we'll say. You know, we, we had anticipated a much greater uh, reduction in plastic bag use. And then to make matters worse, during our observations, um, COVID hit. And so Cuy Cuyahoga County's ban on plastic bag bans came into effect. Again, this was a public health issue at the time, um, but it certainly sort of stalled our research at that point. Now, it didn't completely um, end our project though. Uh, we did have the survey data. So what we found from the surveys is we asked shoppers specifically about the uh, um, reminder items. So the keychain, the magnet, the window decal. Um, unfortunately, uh, shoppers suggested that none of those are very helpful either. So along with handing out, or let me reword that, along with spending money to create reusable bags and handing them out, spending money to create, you know, knickknacks and reminder strategies also didn't seem to be effective. Now we did find from the survey data that um, the store signage was much more effective. As a matter of fact, almost 70% of all respondents said that those signs do make a big difference because you know uh, a lot of people reported leaving their reusable bags in the trunk of their car under their seat. And when they would see the signs, they'd remember, oh, let me grab my bags. So this is good. If, if uh, whether it be a store or municipality is gonna spend money, this was one way to do it. Um, certainly more effective than some of the other strategies. Next slide, please. Um, we also partnered with the uh, Lake County Solid Waste District. Um, they had already made a bunch of reusable bags. You could see some right there in the picture and they were handing them out at farmer's markets. And we thought farmer's markets was an interesting place to conduct some research because there's uh, somewhat of a sustainability ethic uh, engage with farmers markets. And, there, and there's a whole lot of research that suggests that people who shop at farmers markets tend to be environmentally minded. Um, so what we did is a sort of a similar experiment to the stores I mentioned earlier. Um, we sat outside with members of the Solid Waste District at a, uh, uh, a little kiosk. You can kind of see the roof of it right there. And we educated folks who walked by about our project and about the importance of reducing plastic waste. And we handed out these uh, reusable bags that you can see the picture of. And um, then we also did observations and we found a very similar trend to the previous study. People simply weren't using them. So not only did people have the bags because they had been passed out, people just weren't using them. Um, similar to the other studies, however, we conducted uh, or collected a ton of email um, addresses and we sent out a follow-up survey. Next slide, please. 
And uh, this survey was a little different. We, we Instead of focusing on what types of reminder strategies people would uh, think might be helpful, we focused on um, more financial strategies. So basically uh, legislation that bans bags or uh, fees for using a plastic bag. And this part of the project I thought was very reassuring. Um, overwhelmingly, respondents suggested that they favored both uh, legislation to ban plastic bags outright or um, fees for using the bags. And it was really cool because this wasn't just at the municipal level, um, but people also said they would support individual businesses that took it upon themselves to uh, no longer use plastic bags. And we thought this was great. Um, we actually followed this up then with uh, focus groups with businesses to ask uh, who, who took this step, you know, of, of actually eliminating bags from their stores to see, you know, what exactly uh, it led to, you know, were people okay with it? Were people upset? What did it mean financially? And, you know, to really quick to sort of sum up what we learned from these focus groups is that most shoppers were were not only fine with it, but really enthusiastic about it. You know, um, that profits um, not only didn't go down, but for these stores that we worked with actually went up. Now, that certainly could be because the stores were doing well and had great products, um, but we did not see any sort of negative impact upon the store's bottom line when they reduced plastic bags. Um, what folks who worked at these stores suggested is that through placing up signage, training employees properly, putting up social media posts, et cetera, that it sort of educated shoppers about what they were doing and why and why it was important. Uh, next slide, please. So I guess just sort of to sum up this, you know, several years of research, what we know is that Spending money and using resources to purchase and hand out reusable bags doesn't work. Um, the knickknacks and patty wax also are not very helpful. Again, save the money and use them elsewhere. And we know that while people often have a very strong environmental ethic in terms of not wanting to uh, create plastic pollution, it's simply so convenient. Uh, and memories are often short and difficult to remember to bring the reusable bags that voluntary participation also isn't effective. But rather, legislative policies like bans and fees, and even business strategies like simply removing plastic from their stores, uh, seem to be the most effective means of actually reducing plastic in our environment uh, and, and helping out. Thanks, Scott. So, just um, if you need encouragement or guidance on how to reduce plastics, we are working at the university through our extension sustainability team to create tip sheets for people. These are one pages, you know, that have 10 tips on how to phase plastics out of your life. They are on a variety of areas from teaching sustainability to children, plastic free vacation, reducing waste when you go out boating, and if they're free available for download at the hyperlink on this slide. Sorry, my computer is not advancing today. <laughs> also, we've been creating videos. Um, if you're a boater, we have a preventing marine debris while boating video that you're welcome to watch. Again, this just gives you some tips on how to prevent accidental littering when out on the water. Also, if you are interested in doing a beach cleanup, there's lots of groups that do beach cleanups in the state, but it's also something you can easily do on your own, in your own neighborhood, at your school, at your business. And so we created a how to do a beach cleanup video. It talks you through the steps of safely doing a beach cleanup and then also tells you what supplies you'll need for a cleanup. And then lastly, please, if you ever want to reach out to Scott or I, here is our email information. We're happy to ask questions, do presentations for you in the future. And then if you're interested in learning more about Sea Grant, here's our website, as well as all of our social media information. So I just want to say thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and we're happy to entertain questions. All right, great. Thank you, uh, Jill and Scott. This was really great. And we've gotten some great questions throughout the presentation. So let me get uh, started with some questions for uh, Jill and Scott and whatever questions they can't answer today. Um, we'll post those answers to those questions on the website later on. Okay, so first question, we've gotten several questions dealing with um, plastics in general. Um, and so first question we got was, um, which type of plastic poses the greater concern in aquatic environments? Is it the single use or is it more the long-term um, 
plastic? That's a great question. So I'm going to say single use because that's going to be the most prevalent plastic we're finding in the natural environment. So 96% of what we pick up off our beach cleanups are going to be single use plastics. Those are plastics that are designed to be used once and then thrown away. Because they're meant to be thrown away so quickly, they're going to be a cheaper, less structurally sound plastic. So they're going to break down much more quickly into microplastics. And microplastics we're very concerned about because the, that's what we are eating, that's what animals are eating, but it's also incredibly difficult to clean microplastics out of the environment because they're so small. Um, for those two types of, of plastic, so the, the single mm -hmm. use, then, then the longer term use, mm -hmm. um, are, which one of those leaches chemicals more readily? And what is like the, what are some of those typical chemicals that we're talking about? So they're both going to leach chemicals. Um, it just depends on how their exposure to sunlight. Sunlight is what causes the breakdown process in plastic and breaks those bonds down. Um, the chemicals, it's just whatever's, you know, plasticizers, um, all those kinds of things. I can't tell you the specific chemicals. That's not my area of expertise. But the other issue with plastics is it attracts other chemicals to it as well when it's in the water because it doesn't like water. It's hydrophobic. So it'll, um, things like pesticides, PFAS, PCBs, P, um, you know, all those other harmful chemicals that get in there, those will attach onto plastic too. So I call them like little, you know, like chemical death bombs, basically is what I call them. <laughs> They're just nasty because <laughs> they got a lot of nasty stuff in them and then on them. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, We've gotten quite a few questions from people asking, are there biodegradable plastics out there that they that people can use? So biodegradable compostable plastics um, is definitely greenwashing. Um, there are a lot of biodegradable and compostable plastics out there that are, that have virgin plastic in them. So that's the first problem with them. So if you are gonna use these types of products, you need to be incredibly careful at which ones you use and make sure you use your research, do your research. The City of Cleveland Office of Sustainability has a zero waste guide where they outline the companies that they recommend because they're truly biodegradable or compostable plastics. They do, are not contaminated with virgin plastic. So that's the first issue. The second issue with biodegradable plastics is when they get into the natural environment, they behave exactly the same as regular plastic. They can still entangle animals. They still cause issues if they're ingested by animals. They really do not break down at much faster of, well, if they do break, they actually break down more quickly. So then they become those microplastics more quickly. So that's an issue. And then the third issue is if you are using a truly biodegradable or compostable plastic and you want to dispose of it properly, it has to go to industrial composting. You cannot put it in your backyard composting because your backyard composting won't get hot enough and you're not shredding it. When you go to an industrial composter, they get hotter and then they shred everything so that they'll break down more easily. For us here in Ohio, we do not have much access to industrial composting. Um, so honestly, you're just spending more money to throw something away in a landfill. And when something goes to landfill, everyone thinks stuff in landfill breaks down. It doesn't. It doesn't have access to oxygen. Bacteria need oxygen in order to break something down. They don't have that access. So stuff actually mummifies in landfill. So I am not a big fan of biodegradable or compostable plastics unless you are sending them to industrial composting, which we really don't have access to. So I would steer clear of them and use reusables instead or wood or bamboo based products if you're trying to use like single use. Okay, thank you. Um, we've gotten quite a few questions from people about what is 
is there any movement to outlaw plastics? Um, and, the, and one of the questions was specifically for Ohio. And just like, just generally, what is going on in terms of decreasing that plastic and maybe in terms of regulation, people are asking, oh, you know, why, if they're so bad, why are we just not regulating them? Could you kind of go through some of what is going on right now um, for several of the states, maybe some key states and localities? You mentioned Cuyahoga County already. You know, I can start off on this one, Jill. I mean, I think it's important to, um, First of all, really straightforward question, right? And and to me, the the straightforward answer should be, well, why don't state governments just ban plastic bags? You know, it's uh, they're bad for the environment. We've shown that this is bad for the economy, uh, wildlife, et cetera. Unfortunately, there seems to be a battle going on um, between uh, banning bags and bans on banning bags. And unfortunately, what we are seeing is some states creating statewide bans on local bad bag ban ordinances. So uh, you asked what states, um, and Jill, you could correct me. I know you're you know, more informed on this than, than myself, but you know, Michigan, Wisconsin, Florida, I believe, all have statewide bans on local bag ban ordinances. So even if communities want to take this step to ban uh, plastic shopping bags, by state law, they are not allowed to. So I, I think, unfortunately, this is a, this is a topic that that seems you know straightforward to me as an environmentalist, um, but but it's become politicized. Um, Jill, what's going on in Cuyahoga County? I know you've been involved. Yeah. So thanks for talking about that, Scott. So those are called preemption laws, and Scott and I have been working for the past several years with the National Sea Grant Law Center to actually analyze nationwide plastic. Um, reduction strategies. And so we have two memos that are freely available to you. They're, they're not super law jargony. They're actually pretty easy to read. They're only about 10 pages. And they talk about how states are or are not reducing plastics based on legislative policy. So I'll be happy to share that information with Jill and Christina to share with everyone. Um, so that's the first thing. And then with us here in Ohio, we Cuyahoga County is allowed to have its bag ban because of home rule. So basically states, um, you know, there are certain states that allow home rule. Ohio is one of them. So the county is able to um, move forward with a bag ban, but they're not allowed to enforce it. <laughs> so, it, it, you know, and it's something Scott and I have found out that if, unless you're enforcing these environmental policies, they're often not effective. So unfortunately for us here in the Midwest, we tend to be behind on any type of environmental legislation. And that's just because we have a huge plastics industry here in the Midwest. Ohio is growing every day in the amount of plastics industry that is coming to the state. It's because we have access to all of the fracking by products, which are being now used to make plastic. So if you go to Appalachia, we have a huge cracker plant, which they're using fracking byproduct to make plastic products. And so we have a huge plastics lobby that is arguing against any type of pro-environmental policies. And that's only going to get worse um, with the current political market that we see. Now, nationwide, we are working on what is called the Break Free from Plastic Act. It would hold industry accountable for the amount of plastics being created. It would look at, you know, circular economy, more recyclability, removing stuff out of the environment. However, the United States is much farther behind than other countries on any type of plastics reduction legislation. If you look at Asia, if you look at Europe, parts of South America, um, even parts of like Africa and India are starting to implement bag bans or bag fees. So the United States, we're just much farther behind than the rest of the world in type of in regards to any type of legislation. All right, thanks. Thanks, Jill and Scott. That was really great. Um, and another question, this was dealing with a follow-up to the, the study at the farmer's market. Um, and this is what she she asks. Uh, did the follow up observations measure the use of any type of reusable bag, or only use of the bags that were handed out the week prior? Yeah, we use the same template we used at the uh, grocery and clothing stores. So we first observed um, all 
you know, all forms of carrying goods from the farmer's market. So plastic bag, reusable bag, um, you know, box, whatever. Um, we just included a sort of a, a line for, um, for the solid waste bags, the ones that they were observing. So, I mean, if you looked at the whole data set, it was similar to the other stores. People were still overwhelmingly using plastic. I forget the percentage, like almost 70%, if I remember correctly. I don't have it pulled up right now. But, um, you know, what, what concerned the folks at the Solid Waste District is that they had, you know, they'd spend money and effort and human hours trying to create these bags, and nobody was using those bags. So, uh, again, it just kind of reinforces that it's it's not a good use of scarce resources when addressing this issue. All right, thanks, Scott. Um, a question we got was, um, how can we avoid drinking these microplastics? So your first step is to avoid drinking anything out of a plastic bottle because through the putting the cap on that bottle, you're putting microplastics into your drink. So avoid drinking anything out of a plastic bottle. The second thing is um, tap water. You can install like a charcoal filter on, this is what at least has been recommended by medical doctors is putting a filter on your tap water at home. Unfortunately, this can be expensive. Um, and so it's not a feasible option for anyone. But unfortunately, we are eating, breathing, and drinking microplastics in every day. To reduce your breathing in, don't wear synthetic clothing. Stick to natural fibers like cottons, wools, hemps. Um, that'll help you prevent what you breathe in off your clothing. And then as far as eating, um, the less processed your food, the less likely it's going to have, it's, you know, it's not going to be wrapped or contaminated with plastic. So try to eat more of a whole foods filtered water, and then wear natural fiber clothing. All right, thank you. But unfortunately, there's nothing we can do. Where it's just another thing we are exposed to. Um, could you, would you uh, to be able to talk a little bit about what um, researchers have found um, the impacts of like freshwater fish from microplastic bioaccumulation is that something that you would be able to respond? Yes. Yeah, so there are lots of studies being done in the Great Lakes by researchers on the effect of plastics in fish. Um, what they are finding is that pretty much every fish they're catching has microplastics somewhere in its system, whether it's gut contents or gills. Um, so they're in animals in the Great Lakes. And what they're finding with juvenile and larval fish is that it's affecting their growth rates um, because of that exposure to either the plastic chemicals or the chemicals that have now latched onto that plastic. They're, they're not exactly sure which one it's coming from. Um, this is still fairly new research. And so it's something they're looking at, but they are seeing in plankton studies and fish studies that it does affect growth, reproduction, um, feeding rates and stuff like that. There was one study, this is now on the Pacific Ocean in coho salmon where they linked salmon mortality to the chemicals associated with tire rubber. Tire rubber is an emerging microplastic of concern. It's when our tires, when we drive down the road, it sheds pieces onto the road and then that gets into the water. And so that was the first study of its kind linking um, plastic chemicals to mortality in a living organism. All right, thank you. Um, we've had a couple of questions dealing with what um, food pantries should do. Um, uh, do you have recommendations of what they should use as an alternative because of the fact that reusable bags are not allowed for sanitary reasons? So is there a recommendation that you would have other than that white single-use bag? So my first recommendation is um, if they could use, if people could bring their own bags, um, People, and it doesn't have to be a reusable bag. It can be a duffel bag, a backpack, a box. I mean, it can be anything you bring from your home that can carry stuff. So ask people to bring stuff and maybe as an incentive, if you bring your own carrying bag or whatever, you get 
two extra food items or something like that. Um, the other option is if they have access to boxes, stores have a surplus of boxes. Um, can they just have access to those boxes for people to take for items? And then third would be last resort if that you do have people who still use single use plastic bags instead of sending them to recycling because they're not really being recycled. Um, could they donate those bags that they've used for their own groceries to then use at the food pantry? So that bag is at least being used again, and then encouraging that individual to use that as like a garbage bag or something. Um, so instead of just getting one use out of a single use plastic bag, you're now getting three uses out of it. All right, thank you. <clears throat> um, have you seen any research on how the shop and scan type of um, technology that you're seeing in some of the grocery stores, is that at all helping um, decrease the, the use of single use plastic? I have not seen any research or done any research on that. Okay. Um, my only thought is that if you are in control now of bagging your own groceries, um, can you just put it in your cart and then put it in your bags and then you don't have to, you know, try to have a conversation with a, a bagger at a store to not use plastic. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't really sure. I thought it was an interesting question. So I just wanted to throw that out to you. Yeah. I, I don't know. And I do know a lot of people switch to like curbside pickup. Um, I believe you could ask to have your items put in reusable bags. However, that that's not the new situation we want to create where we've now switching from, okay, I use 10 single use plastic bags per grocery trip. Now I'm using three new reusable bags, every grocery trip, reusable bags are incredibly expensive to make cost wise, but also natural resource wise. So I do not want to say use a brand new reusable bag. Every time you go grocery shopping, no, use the same five bags for 20 years. That's people in general need to use less stuff in general. So I don't want us to be like, oh, let's just use reusable bags. No, they're still made out of plastic. They're still just as problematic, but you're gonna use less of them over time. Okay, thank you. All right, I have two more questions and then I'll let you guys go if you're okay with that. Mm -hmm. um, one question was, um, someone asked if there was a way that there could be a store signage template that stores could use to edit and use to help people remember to reuse or to use their reusable bags. Um, that was one question I thought was really good. Um, is, and, and that could be something actually that we could create if, if you all wanted to do that, we could create that and could have that available. You know, Jill, I was going to say that I think our fantastic communications team there you go. Stuff up that, that might work for other states as well, if people were interested. There you that. go. We're, we're <laughs> on it. The other Jill is on it. So yes, <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll do that. Um, I thought that was a great suggestion. Um, the other question that I had was um, uh, that a couple of people asked was, what would you say you had um, that one resource, you had that resource page um, on your PowerPoint of all these different resources. And one was specifically dealing with like kids, what kids can do. Um, what would you say would be like the key ways kids could get involved with regards to plastic and make that difference? So kids are actually, when we do outreach and education, the most receptive and understanding of this issue, I feel like, and they're the ones who quickly want to make changes. Um, so when we work with kids, I tell them to start with their school lunch. And there can be a lot of plastic waste in a school lunch. It could be, you know, maybe a couple sandwich bags, a juice box or Capri Sun or something like that. Um, maybe any plastic utensils that they'd use, you know, is it going in a paper bag? So I encourage kids to start with their school lunch and try to make their school lunch as zero waste as possible. And one of our tip sheets is actually focused on a zero waste lunch. Um, for kids. And then the other thing they can do is it's really easy for them to pick up trash um, around their neighborhood. 
and stuff like that. So that's another way we encourage kids to get involved. All right. Thank you. Um, I think that resource page is a great one. So I'm sure people will be referencing that for more information. Um, we have several more questions, but what we'll do is I'll see if uh, Jill and Scott can answer those in a Word document and we'll just mm -hmm. post those on to the website here a little bit later. Um, so I wanted to just wrap this up. Um, I wanted to thank again, uh, Jill and Scott for their willingness to talk to us today about their plastic research. This was really an excellent discussion. So thank you, uh, Jill and Scott. Also, a thank you to Christina Dierkes for her work in organizing this webinar series. Um, I'd like to, to remind everyone that we have a survey URL of for this webinar in the chat feature. So please feel free to, to uh, take a few minutes and fill that out. Um, this webinar series is sponsored by Ohio Sea Grant and will continue next month with uh, Kent State University's Jen Mao and Laura Leff, who will be talking about their pharmaceuticals and personal care product contamination research. Uh, the registration link is in the chat. Thank you again to Jill and Scott and all the participants on this webinar. We hope this was really beneficial and hope you'll uh, join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you again and have a great afternoon. Thanks again, Jill and Scott. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a Thank good day. Thank you.